So in last week's sermon, we were thinking about faith. We were looking at the example of Abraham and thinking about what it actually means to live by faith. Now, in the sermon today, we are looking at hope, what it means to have hope in the world and particularly in the Christian life. Now, hope is a really powerful thing, isn't it? You know, that hope gives us the power to get through, to get through hard times, to get through life. You know, you can't really get through life without hope, I think. And hope is in short supply these days. You know, looking at the the problems in the world at the moment, then hope is in really short supply. Uh, And that's something which we're going to be thinking about is, is where actually we get our hope from as Christians. Now, I'd just like to to say, by the way, just as an aside, I apologise if you were watching the video, the sermon video last week, because I was completely out of focus through the whole video. That was a that was my blunder. But I just wanted to apologise for that. And I I hope I've learnt my lesson and that won't happen again. But it's just I should have turned it off and on again. You know that that would have sorted it out. But um, that's that's the way it goes. Um, I should have taken a lesson from the IT crowd. Um, Anyway, all that aside, hopefully it won't be like that today. So let's uh, let's start then. We're looking at Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. Let's start out with what Paul says. He, He begins by saying, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just uh, to point out here that he starts out by talking about we. Remember, right at the start of Romans, he said I, and he talked about my gospel, and then he talked about you, he talked about the, you know, the moralistic world, he talked about the Jews, Uh, but now he's talking about, you know, Jew and Gentile together. He's talking about, you know, all God's people, he's saying we. So since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So Paul here gives a little outline summary of the gospel and you notice it's past, present and future. So he says that uh, we have gained access by faith. We've gained access by faith. So you now we put our faith in God, in Jesus Christ, we have gained access. And then he says, we, we, and we have peace with God as well. Then it says, we stand in uh, this grace in which we now stand. So we're standing in grace. We are living by grace through faith. And he says, and then we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So that's the future. So we've, we've put our faith in Christ, that's in the past, we stand in grace in the present and we have hope in the glory of God, you know, to be to be revealed. Past, present and future, all three are contained in, in the gospel. And that's something which uh, many Christians through the ages have, have said. I think, I think John Newton expressed this well. John Newton, who famously wrote Amazing Grace, but uh, he said a lot of good things. And one of the things that he said, which I really like, he said, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. I like that. It sort of encapsulates it all, doesn't it? Saying that, yes, you know, I'm not, I'm not what I hope to be. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I will be one day in another world, but I'm not what I used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. I think it it's, it's sums up beautifully what Paul is saying here. That's the Christian life. It's saying that, you know, yes, we are sinners, but we've been saved. We are being saved and we will one day it will be complete. We'll be completely saved, if you like. Um, so. Paul, that's how Paul begins. And then he moves on to talk about the hope that that gives us in suffering. So he goes on to say, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings 
because we know that suffering produces uh, perseverance and so on. Now, what does he mean by sufferings here? The word suffering is sometimes translated, and especially in the sort of the older translations, as the word tribulation. Now, this isn't a word that we use very often, tribulation. I think it brings images of kind of apocalyptic end time sort of things. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just not a common word, is it, tribulation? But I think it's helpful to, to bear that in mind because what Paul, I believe, what Paul is talking about here is not sufferings in general, you know, like um, undergoing a bereavement or being out of work or financial difficulties or, or so on. I don't think Paul is talking about that kind of suffering specifically, but he's talking about the kind of suffering that comes from sin. This is what Jesus said in uh, John chapter 16, verse 33. And he says, uh, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In this world you will have trouble. It's the same word that Paul uses here. You will have trouble, you will have suffering. And I believe that what Jesus and what Paul is talking about is not, you know, general sufferings, the kind of suffering that happens in, in the world to everyone, but suffering that happens because of sin. And, you know, you, you don't have to be a Christian very long, do you, to realise that sin is our biggest enemy. In fact, our biggest enemy, really, you could say, is ourselves because you know we are sinners and we face that battle every day and what kind of suffering does that mean i think it means you know we mourn over our own sin that we we mourn as john newton did because we recognize that we are not what we ought to be and we recognize that you know we do fall short as paul has said previously in romans we fall short of what god expects and requires of us and it's a grief isn't it it should be a grief to us that we fall short this is actually what we were saying a few months ago if you were uh, with us back then if not you can go back and watch the sermon if you want but in Matthew chapter 5 the Beatitudes right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount Jesus says blessed are those who mourn and what he means by that is blessed are those who mourn over their own sin Blessed are those who are grieved by their own sin and by the sin in the world. This is what it says in Psalm 119, verse 136. Psalm 119, verse 136, which says, Streams of tears flown from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. So the psalmist knew what it meant to weep and grieve over the sin in the world, the sin in his own life and the sin in the world. And that's what the Christian experience is. We weep and we grieve, we suffer because of our sin and because of the sin in the world. And I think that, you know, suffering, the, the general sense of suffering and this sense of, of suffering can go together. And I often think this actually, that you know, when I go through a hard time, then the thing that grieves me about it is that I, I respond to it in a sinful way. You know, I don't respond with trust. I don't respond with taking it to the Lord in prayer. You know, but I, I worry, I fret. I, I, you know, I, I don't uh, deal with these things in a godly way. And that is, that's how I think the two things kind of come together. Um, so we, we battle, we, we suffer with, with sin. And then Paul says, but, uh, but we glory in that. Now, how can we glory in that kind of suffering? How do we glory in that? And this is what he goes on to say. He says, we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character and character, hope. So suffering produces perseverance. You know, when we go through that kind of uh, that kind of suffering, um, um, our own sinfulness and the sinfulness in, in the world, then we persevere. Now, we don't talk about perseverance much these days. Uh, it's not a characteristic, a, a sort of quality 
which people desire very much, is it? But the Bible's got a lot to say about perseverance, you know, and persevering is a good thing because Paul says it leads to character. And character here, the word actually, it, it comes from a, uh, uh, the same kind of word as testing. It basically means uh, when something has been tested and found worthy. You know that you get sometimes when you buy a new product and it will say QA, you know, and, and, and signed and, and dated and, and what have you. You know that it's been tested and it's been found to work and it's been found, you know, it, it's effective. And it's the same kind of thing, you know, that when we persevere, then we are found, we are tested and found to have passed the test. And that character, that testing, uh, produces hope in us. And that's what Paul says. And he says, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, what does Paul mean here? I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb here and I'm going to disagree with some of the commentators on this who say that what this means is that uh, we sit there and kind of think about how much God loves us. You know, that the Holy Spirit helps us to understand how much God loves us. And, you know, we just have that that sense of warmth. Oh, God loves me. Isn't that nice? You know, and I know that some people really do have that experience, but I don't think that's what Paul means. I don't think that's what Paul means. I think Paul means something different. I think what Paul means is more in line with what he says in uh, Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 22, where he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace and patience and so on. So Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, how do we know that the Spirit is living in us? Because the Spirit gives us God's love. That doesn't mean an experience of God's love for us. Although that's a good thing to have and it's a good thing to want and to pray for, uh, I, I don't think it's, you know, some people don't seem to be given that experience. For whatever reason, uh, God has God has his reasons. And I've had people say to me, well, Phil, I don't feel like God loves me. And does that mean I'm not a Christian? And I don't think we can use this verse to say, you know, to say anything about that. I don't, I just don't think that's what Paul is talking about because not every Christian seems to have that experience. I think what Paul is saying is the Holy Spirit gives us love for God and for others. Because remember that sin is a lack of love. You know, sin is when we don't love God, when we don't love our neighbour as ourselves. Sin is a lack of love in us. And so the Holy Spirit helps us with our lack. The Holy Spirit kind of gives us that which we lack. And that's how we know that the Holy Spirit is, is living in us, is if, is if we're able to, to do that which we can't do by nature, which is to, to begin to love God and to love others. So Paul goes on to talk about the grounds of our confidence, you know, how we can be confident in, in God and how we can be confident in this. And he says, uh, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. It made me think, actually, who would you die for? Who would you die for? I remember when I was at school, we, um, we were talking about the question, I think this was in an RE class, you know, would you die for, you know, would you die for your mother? Would you die for so on and so forth? And um, you know, we had an interesting discussion about this. But some people do die uh, for others. It happened to a man called a Maximilian Kolbe, and he was um, a, a priest, a Roman Catholic priest. During the Second World War, he was put into a concentration camp. He was put into Auschwitz, actually, because he was aiding the Jews. 
and uh, he was put into Auschwitz and um, a prisoner escaped from Auschwitz and the guards decided that they would put ten, take 10 people at random and put them in a, in a bunker and not feed them and basically starve them to death because that would deter other people from escaping. And um, as they were, they selected these 10, 10 men to go in. And as one, you know, one of them was picked and he, he just shouted out, oh, my wife and my children. Maximilian Kolbe, who was in his late 40s, he went up to the guards and he said, you know, this man is a younger man. He has a wife and he has children. Take me instead. And so they did. Uh, to everyone's amazement, Maximilian Kolbe went in to the bunker and the other man went back and he, he actually survived. Or as Maximilian Kolbe, he, he was killed. Now, that's a story, uh, I think that, that kind of thing, it's notable, isn't it? Because it's so rare that, you know, who would die for someone else like that? I mean, what this, this man did is a rare thing indeed and it should be you know he should be hailed as a as a hero you know in, in some respects because it that's that's a very rare thing to give up your life for for the love of someone else but if you think that that's rare for for humans think about what it's like for god to do and that's the paul that the, the point that paul makes verse 8 but god demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That word demonstrates can also mean, you know, proves. God proves that he loves us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he says in verse 6, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, Christ didn't die for us because we were worthy. Christ didn't die for us because he felt, you know, um, sympathy because you know we had dependence or, or whatever but Christ died for us out of love that was the reason why he died and that is shows the greatness of his love that when we were still dead in our sins Christ died for us and think then how confident we should be that we will be redeemed you know, you think of all of the battles that we have with sin. Think of all the struggle that we have day by day. And you think Christ died to redeem the likes of you and me. And that, that, that gives us confidence that one day that struggle will be over. Because Christ died for us even before we had we come to him. You know, Christ died for us while we were ungodly, while we were still powerless. And we can have hope for the future as well. We can have hope for the future. And that's what Paul finishes this section with. He says, uh, he actually uses the same kind of argument twice, actually. He says, since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Um, for if we were reconciled while we were God's enemies, how much more we shall be saved through his life? So Paul basically says, look, if we were reconciled while we were enemies of God, if we've been justified, how much more then will we, be, will we be saved on the day of judgment? How much more will we be saved? And Paul mentions um, God's, God's wrath here. And I think it's, it's um, good to rem remind ourselves once again that God's wrath is the response to sin, isn't it? And this is this is what it says. L let me read you, for example, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Because of our sinfulness, that, that, that provokes God's anger but Paul says if we've been justified with Christ how much more will we be saved on the day of judgment that God is not going to leave the job unfinished 
And, and that's really the big point that he's making here. He says, look, it will be a nonsense for God to, to do one without the other. Now, how could God save us and then abandon us on the day of judgment and in, in eternal life? Now, it would be nonsense for God to start helping us, but then not to help us into eternity. You know, what, what God starts, he finishes. And that our battles with sin will one day be over and we will inherit eternal life and, and the blessedness and, and the perfection that goes along with that. We can be certain of it. And if God has saved us, how much more will he save us on, on that day? So that's what Paul says. We have hope for the future as well. Now, what can we conclude from this? What, what conclusions can we draw that, that help, you know, just to, to take into this this coming week? What can we be thinking about? Um, well, we know that the Christian life, at the end of the day, it's a battle against sin, isn't it? Really, that's the, the distinguishing feature of the Christian life. I remember when I was, uh, a few years ago, we did, um, a, I think, a Christianity Explored course. And there was a woman who came to faith, you know, she came on the course, came to faith. And she said to me after having done that, you know, a few weeks later, before I was a Christian, everything was easy, it seemed. But now I've become a Christian, it seems like things are harder, you know, because I'm constantly thinking about the wrong things that I'm doing. And it's, it's just added a whole level of sort of complexity and difficulty to life. And, and in a sense, that's true, isn't it? You know, that people who are not Christian, you know, they don't realise what they're doing wrong and they don't think about it. Whereas if you're a Christian, then you're constantly aware of, of these things. And I will say, by the way, I think that does get better over time. I think we become more, you know, we don't, don't worry about things in quite that same intense way day by day, but it, it does improve. But it's true, isn't it, that, you know, that this kind of suffering over our own sinfulness and suffering in, you know, because of the sinfulness in the world, that is just part and parcel of what it means to be a Christian. In fact, it's an indispensable part of what it means to be a Christian. And Paul says um, elsewhere that you know, it's through many of these kind of sufferings, through many of this tribulation, we must go to enter the kingdom of God. It's just what the way that God does things, it's, it's how it is. Um, but we know that that's not a bad thing. In the sense that, as many Christians have learned through the ages, that it is through the struggle that we grow and that we get perseverance, that we get character, that we get hope. This is what Christians through the centuries have learned. And one example of that is, is uh, Charles Spurgeon, a great Baptist preacher. And um, he once said, I have learnt to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I've learnt to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. That's what Spurgeon said, that he's learnt that, that what throws him against God's grace is a good thing. And that when we are assaulted by our uh, tribulations, our sufferings, our sinfulness, then it throws us upon God's grace and that's when we grow. And I know that many people can testify to that as, as Christians, that the times of growth are when we do go through these, these times of trial, times of suffering, but particularly when we struggle with our own sinfulness. And we must remember that we have hope. And that's what I want to finish with, to remember that we have hope. Firstly, we have the hope of the Holy Spirit. Because what we can't do ourselves, the Holy Spirit can do in us. That's the big hope that Paul is talking about, that what we are unable to do ourselves, that the Holy Spirit can do. Now, and although we can't make ourselves love, and we can't make ourselves love God and love others, and although we are confronted with that day by day, we can ask for God's help. We, we can ask for the help of the Holy Spirit to do that which we can't do. We also have a demonstration of God's love in Christ's death and in his blood shed for us. Now, if you doubt that you know, God loves you, 
then don't look to your own feelings, but look back instead to the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you on the cross. That is the moment when God's love for us was truly proved and, and demonstrated. It's through the, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. And that gives us that hope that he will finish the, the work that he's doing in us. And the third thing is that we have a future hope of glory. Because if Jesus came and died for us, we can be sure that he will finish that job and one day he will return and will take us to be with him and we will inherit eternal life with him forever. And that is our hope. That is our hope. It's past, present and future. It's hope for our sinfulness. We, we hope that, that God will change us and he can change us, he will change us. We hope that God will change other people too. And I think this gives us hope that, you know, when uh, we, we may have friends, family members, whoever who we're praying for, we'd love to see come to faith. And uh, I was really struck by that verse, by the way, I didn't mention this at the time, but just those words, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's the thing, isn't it? That's our hope that, you know, Christ saves sinners. He saved us and he will save us. And it's the same for, for others too. We can be hoping and praying for them as well. And we know that hope does not put us to shame. So let's take a moment to pray and ask for God to give us that hope this week. Give us that, that faith and trust in him and that he would, uh, by the, the power of the Holy Spirit, pour out that love into our hearts so that we may love him and love others more. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to persevere in the struggle against sin. We pray that you would help us to, to persevere with you so that we may be tested and, and proved genuine and so that we may have hope. And we pray that you would give us a greater sense of that hope, Lord, in our own lives and uh, looking in at the, the sinfulness of the world. We pray that you would help us to have hope that you would bring real change and we pray, Lord, that you would pour out more of your love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit so that we might love you more and love others more. And that we ask, Lord, that you would uh, do these things through the name of Jesus Christ, in whom we have put our trust. Amen.